We're going to look at Martin Lloyd-Jones as a preacher, and we normally meet Saturday mornings, uh, but we're going to do this uh, the way we're doing it now because of the situation in which we're in. Uh, so it's Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, and I'll spend the, the first hour or so uh, on his life and his controversies, and uh, then have a quick look at some of the aspects of his preaching, and I hope to spend the next hour uh, there will be a break in between uh, on him as a preacher. So we'll see what we learn from him, whether you're a preacher or not. Uh, he is a man of God and we can all learn much from him. So let's pray together first and commend our time to God. Father, help us. Uh, we pray. Uh, we look to you. We thank you for those who you have sent down through the ages uh, to be a special help. Uh, to pilgrims on the way to the celestial city and help us now as we look at Martin Lloyd-Jones, your servant of old. Uh, we ask that he, though being dead, would speak to us and he would speak to us of the things that he spoke of, of the glory of Christ Jesus, uh, of his great grace, of the truth of your word and what it means to be those who, who own it, who seek to make it known and who hear it, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, David, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, Martin, of course, spelt M-A-R-T-Y-N. It's amazing how often you see it misspelt uh, as, as I-N. Uh, but he was, he was Welshman, and he was born in Cardiff, in Wales, of course, and he was born on the 20th of December, 1899. So as you work through the century, uh, he's as old as the century. So 1940, he's, he's 40, and 1960, he's 60, and so on. Uh, so he's born in Wales, uh, but there was a fire in the family home and, and the shop, and so the whole family relocated uh, to London in 1914. And <clears throat> two years later, 1916, uh, he began medical training. And he was always known, well, in many circles, known as the doctor, uh, particularly those who had met him. Of course, I'm not one. Uh, and, but he rose to become the chief clinical assistant to Sir Thomas Horder, who was actually the king's personal physician. Uh, so he was doing very well uh, as a doctor in the medical sphere. He always retained a great interest in, in um, medicine and to the... And of his days, uh, it would engage in diagnosis uh, and, and was a help to people medically too. But he became a Christian. Uh, and in 1926, he turned his back on this very promising medical career and he became a missioner <coughs> in uh, Sandfields, which is in South Wales. So he went back to, to Wales uh, to work there and to work in a very unpromising area. Uh, he, he, he didn't uh, land on his feet, as it were. He, he went to work in, in a place where uh, the, the Christian cause had struggled and people were struggling. He married Bethan Phillips. Uh, she was actually about 18 months older than he uh, and uh, different sort of personality. Uh, she loved tennis. I don't think Martin Lloyd Jones ever had much interest in games, uh, or not not uh, those sort of games. Anyway, uh, he married her in 1927, and they had two uh, girls. Uh, so that was the family. He doesn't say anything that I know of of his conversion, uh, and we know almost nothing about it. He set no date for it. Uh, he, there's, there's indications of it. He, he went to a play once and he uh, came out after the play had finished and there was a Salvation Army band playing and he was convinced these are the people I belong to. That was a conviction that uh, he possessed that time. He knew where he was heading and it was not the, 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 to the theatre. Uh, it was not to the Salvation Army as such either, but to the people of God. He saw himself fundamentally as an evangelist. He was not apologist. Uh, 
Uh, he's not a theologian. Uh, clearly, he was both. But he saw himself first and foremost as an evangelist. And had he regarded anything that detracted from that as that which ought to be removed from the life of the church. Uh, he lived in the age where Band of Hope uh, ministries were, were very strong and it was often regarded as part of the evangelical culture to have a Band of Hope where people would sign up, uh, would sign a pledge uh, that they would be total abstainers from alcohol. Uh, he regarded those ministries as a waste of time. The first thing you need to do is uh, get rid of them because <laughs> uh, they detracted from the gospel. Uh, that the gospel would solve these problems. He don't solve these problems by getting people to sign pledges. Uh, he saw no point in multiplying committees. He had ne never had much time for committees. Like He's like Spurgeon in that respect. Uh, and he said the best thing I ever did was to refuse to go on committees. Uh, so he saw them as that which was a substitute for true gospel work rather than preparing for it. His ministry was based very squarely on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, and uh, he began his ministry at Sandfields in Aberavon uh, on the 28th of November, 1926, preaching on that text. That was his first text. And 50 years later... He preached on that same text, celebrating the uh, 50th year of his ministry, preached on the same text, not the same sermon, but the same text. And, and for that matter, that's the text that's carved into his, uh, his gravestone. So he uh, worked, he, he based his whole ministry on, on that text from 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. He only ever had two pastorates, um, Sandfields, the first one, in South Wales. And the second one, of course, was at Westminster Chapel, where just before World War II broke out, uh, he joined the ageing G. Campbell Morgan, and he remained there, uh, that's what his Martin Lord Jones remained there, until his retirement in 1968, where he uh, fell ill uh, quite suddenly with cancer. Um, his life was under threat, and he had to undergo an operation, uh, and uh, he, he was forced into retirement. He d did live till 1981, and he spent his retirement very profitably. Uh, but let's go back to Westminster Chapel, and there's a different uh, way of doing uh, church. There were no printed sheets. Uh, hymns and, and sermons were never finalised until the preceding day. So, so nothing could be done. And, and so there are some of his practices which I think would be difficult to sustain. Uh, here we are, uh, <coughs> you know, 90 years later, uh, 80, 90 years later, uh, we're not used to that. Uh, I su suspect uh, church musicians would not be keen on his ap approach. You have to be able to sight read very well uh, and know the know the hymn. Uh, he he followed Spurgeon in that regard because uh, Spurgeon never decided finally until Saturday night what what he was going to do next, and. There was always this uh, tremendous de dependence upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could lead you in a way uh, that uh, you had not planned, and so he distrusted programs. He dis distrusted, distrusted uh, you know, five-year plans, ten-year plans. Uh, he, God has a way of undoing all those. Uh, he even distrusted a you know, one-week plan, uh, which is not to say he had no plan, but his plan was quite flexible, and he... He sought the leading of the Holy Spirit. In the last 13 years or so of his life, he was very active. He was still preaching once he'd recovered, uh, I suppose you do, uh, from the cancer. He prepared some of his sermons and lectures uh, for publication. Uh, so he was quite active in uh, the last years of his life. 
He had a reputation for being severe. And uh, if you see photos of him, sometimes that's exactly what he looks like. He, in that respect, he looked like John Murray. He uh, uh, looks like someone looking down at you and, uh, and uh, uh, somewhat intimidating. Uh, he once confessed, I was never an, an adolescent. And there is that about him. Uh, well, that was another side too. I think the side that people did see that often the outsider, uh, including me, uh, they didn't see it until you uh, uncovered uh, more anecdotes about him. In his teens, he observed the whole world involved in war. They'd moved back, or they'd moved to London, or back to London. They'd moved from Wales, the family had moved to, from Wales uh, to London in 1914. Of course, that was the year that this terrible war broke out. The war to end wars was not the war to end wars, it was just the First World War, there was another one to come. Uh, he believed, what most people believed then, that politics would prove the salvation of the world. This was the age of what, what became you know, uh, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and uh, the League of Nations and all the hopes uh, attached to that. Uh, he, he imbibed that. He, he later very disillusioned with it, rejected it, uh, but in his teens, uh, that's what he believed. There's another side to him too. There's, uh, I've, I've quoted himself there where he said, oh, I was never an adolescent. But he, he, he something I didn't know until uh, quite late, he, he, he loved horses and he regarded horses as, these are his words, undeniable proof of the being of God. You see the being of God in a horse. The horse is such a magnificent creature, points to a magnificent creative. Uh, issues that were strong in evangelical churches in the late 19th century, they became stronger, late 19th and early 20th century. Sabbatarianism and teetotalism. Uh, he always sat a, a, rather loosely on, on that. That's not quite the right word. Uh, but he regarded, on, on Sabbatarianism, keeping the Sabbaths, he really didn't go much further than urged that Sunday be different. <clears throat> and so that was his emphasis there. Teetotalism, he didn't drink himself. He didn't drink alcohol himself, but he didn't regard it as a sin. So he didn't, he never majored on it, and never even minored on it. Uh, so the, the two great issues that drove the evangelical churches, or the Protestant churches, whether they were liberal or evangelical, uh, didn't matter what wing, uh, the, the dominant issues in the late 19th, 13th, 20th centuries were those two, you know, keeping the Sunday uh, and uh, uh, drinking of alcohol. And he sat loosely on those uh, without saying they were unimportant, uh, that that would be... Uh, to misinterpret him and to misrepresent him. The ecumenical movement was also gathering in strength. And all through the days of the ecumenical movement, uh, he would say life is more important than unity. Uh, people em emphasise unity and say, if only we're unified, uh, the world would pay attention to us and the world would be a better place and uh, people would become Christians. He did not believe that. Life is more important than unity. That's one of the Great lessons of his life, I think. He, he said that he was something of a hero worshipper and he knew quite a bit about history and he, he would go delve into strange places uh, and, uh, and, and knew his way around quite well. Uh, and he loved people that he loved. Uh, so, yeah, Christmas Evans, people like that. Um, he, and he would write on them, and he, he knew them well uh, as historical figures. And as I say, some, he, he said himself he was something of a hero worshipper. But he hated the celebrity cult and, and the trends of the 20th century and into the 21st century were trends that he utterly opposed. And uh, he made this observation. He says, have you ever observed that some of the most honoured servants of God in evangelism have been extremely ugly men? And, and uh, very confronting uh, to an evangelist, uh, to preachers, but uh, and very counterintuitive, where 
this is the age of presentation. This is the age where uh, things are polished. This is the age where things are, are, are well presented and uh, you don't want an ugly preacher. <laughs> and, and Lloyd Jones is saying, well, the opposite is true. God has down through the ages used very ugly men. He, he detested publicity campaigns, uh, uh, particularly a man-centred publicity campaign that was utterly abhorrent to him. Uh, in 1974, uh, he preached for John Davies in Bethel, or Clyduck, near uh, Swansea, and he, he, he reported this, that we had a public meeting, preaching meeting, on the Saturday evening, but he strictly asked me not to advertise his presence on the Sunday so he could be free to minister to our own people. And the church profited immensely from his visit. Now, his thinking there was, uh, I don't turn this into a publicity campaign for Martin Lloyd-Jones so people come along and listen to him. Uh, they came on the Saturday, but Sunday, the worship service gathered together. I want the people of God to gather together. Now, whether you agree with his thinking or not, what drives it, what motivates it, is this uh, adhorrence of uh, a publicity campaign and a centering on on the human being is what it's all about. He says, no, it's about God. Uh, he knew depression, although not very often. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's a depressed character at all. Uh, quite the reverse. I think underneath this, uh, this strong stability and even uh, joy in, uh, in his life, his, his Christian life. But he, he knew a period of depression in 1949 he understood this later as a result of overwork. Uh, he was simply exhausted and uh, a satanic attack. And humanly speaking, it, it was reading Richard Sibbs as a bruised reed. He always loved that, and I'll commend that to you. It's a wonderful book. Richard Sibbs, a bruised reed, and uh, the word glory. If you've uh, heard or listened to his, uh, or uh, read his sermons, you know how much he loved the word glory. And uh, that brought him through it, Sibs, and pondering, meditating on this word, glory. And he saw later that he believed that a close friend of his <coughs> was actually a foe, and uh, that distorted his thinking for a time. He just, all his thinking was dislocated and, and distorted, and uh, he wasn't seeing reality for what it was. He became involved in a number of controversies. Uh, I mentioned three here, but I mean, we could say there were more. There are always more, aren't there? Uh, but the three best-known ones, uh, well, the first one is to do with the Billy Graham crusade. 1954, Billy Graham came to the, the United Kingdom, came to London. Uh, it was the Harringay crusade in North London. And Billy, uh, Billy, Graham, the Billy Graham Association had asked Martin Lloyd-Jones to be chairman of that crusade. Martin Lloyd-Jones met Billy Graham, but Martin Lloyd-Jones refused to be the chairman of the crusade unless Graham agree, agreed to two conditions. And these were the two conditions. Now, the first one was that there would be no non-evangelicals, Roman Catholics or theological liberals on stage with Graham. Now, of course, they could turn up. Uh, they could be there to hear him, but they were not to be on stage with him. They were not to be in official leadership positions and inquirers or converts, whatever they were at the end, were not to be sent to their churches. So it's really a, a working out of, say, Machen's uh, Christianity and liberalism that then they don't belong together. Theological liberals are not uh, you know, naughty members of the family, but they're still part of the family. That's not it. They're not part of the family. They have a different gospel, and it's not the biblical gospel. And so that, that was the first condition that uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones set before Billy Graham. And the second one was that he would not use the invitation system. 
Uh, Martin Lord Jones always regarded this as doing more harm than good. He, he wasn't saying, of course, that, that nobody was ever converted through the invitation system, but he, he said it was far more likely to produce people who thought they were Christians but weren't than it would uh, produce genuine Christians. There were so many who walked forward who had not heard the gospel. They might get converted later. It might be part of their journey, but it would confuse things right back at the beginning uh, to use the invitation system. Now, some people then read that as saying, well, he didn't press the gospel on people. Well, he did. Uh, he, he pressed very hard, but he left the Holy Spirit to do his work, and he saw the invitation as a man usurping the work of the Holy Spirit. So those were the two conditions. Uh, Billy Graham, of course, uh, refused both conditions, and they parted company. Uh, Billy... Graham was assured that uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones would pray uh, for the crusade, and he, and he did, and uh, remained as friendly as he, as he could. Um, but the, there was a, a difference there, a highlighted difference between two versions of the evangelical faith. Yeah, and so that's, that was a controversy, uh, and as Billy Graham increased in popularity, that it became one that would come back to, to, uh, to Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, particularly because of uh, people like John Stott being so close to Billy Graham, but also close you know, geographically, proximity uh, to Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this whole issue of evangelicalism being identified with Billy Graham. You think evangelical, you think Billy Graham. Uh, that's not how Martin Lloyd-Jones thought. He was not hostile to Graham. He, he didn't attack Graham, um, but he did indicate his difference from him. So that's the first controversy. There was a second... I'm only picking out three main ones. Uh, the second controversy that we're looking at is uh, that which came in the early 60s. Lloyd-Jones very much longed for revival. He, he saw conditions as very serious and in, in a sad state of declension. And he urged prayer for revival, and he rejected cessationism. Now, cessationism, I, uh, to say, go back to B.B. Warfield, cessationism is the view that uh, there were no miracles after the apostles because the apostles' miracles were uh, to identify them with the Messiah. So the Messianic miracles and the apostolic miracles there's a continuity there, and that was to show the authority of the apostles. Once the apostles die out, there's no need for them, and claims to miracles since then are, are fraudulent. They're hoaxes. Uh, they're counterfeit miracles. Now, Lloyd-Jones never held that view, and he sought a greater work of the Holy Spirit, uh, and those two views became connected. He rejected cessationism, he, and uh, he he looked for revival. He, I think, he says some unguarded things uh, on the ceiling of the spirit, for example, in one Corinthians, uh, in Ephesians, and chapter one, and and verse thirteen, where I think the context is obvious that every Christian is sealed by uh, by the Holy Spirit, but he would. He would tend to identify the baptism of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, and the sealing of the Spirit as, as, as experiences which could come after conversion. So he didn't believe in a second blessing. He believed that there could be a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, <coughs> as many blessings as God was uh, deigned to bestow upon us. Uh, it could be a hundred baptisms of the Spirit uh, in a, that uh, a Christian might enjoy. Uh, and the, the, the New Testament is not watertight, if I am use that word, uh, on the distinctions between these, uh, you know, the baptism of the Spirit, serving of the Spirit, and uh, filling with the Spirit. But I think that there is more of an order than, than uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones thought. Um, the baptism of the Spirit is identified with conversion, surely, in 1 Corinthians 12, you're all baptised with the Spirit, in verse 13, 
so he's not seeing there's two classes of Christians or three classes or whatever, uh, that <coughs> if, if a person's Christian, he's baptised with the Spirit. And that would f fit in with um, the promises uh, that are fulfilled with the coming of the Spirit in in Acts 2, all those promises in the Gospels. Uh, uh, I baptise, says John the Baptist, with water, but he, he the Messiah, the coming one, baptised with the Holy Spirit. And that happens at the day of Pentecost. Uh, the filling of the Spirit seems to... to Come and go, doesn't it? Uh, uh, this experience, and uh, sometimes we're urged to seek it, to seek the filling of the Spirit, and sometimes uh, a preacher will get up and, and uh, he'll be filled with the Spirit, and it seems to, that this is an experience that just comes upon uh, him or her. Uh, so uh, that that doesn't seem to be quite the same thing. Sealing with the Spirit, as I mentioned earlier, seems to be something that uh, all Christians have. Now, a lot of controversies get out of hand, and this got somewhat out of hand. Uh, the charismatic movement was just starting to, to uh, emerge in, in mainstream churches, the variation of Pentecostalism, and Lloyd-Jones was often seen as a, a friend of the charismatics and the Pentecostals. I, I don't think Peter Masters was being very helpful, uh, when he saw Martin Lord Jones's views simply as a capitulation to Pentecostalism, uh, I don't think that's a helpful way of looking at it. I, I do think Martin Lord Jones made an invaluable contribution to his own problems on this issue, uh, but a, a grasp of the theological and, and the chronological sequence makes some sense of his response. Uh, uh, so, probably fair to say that identifying the baptism of the Spirit was filling. Uh, with the spirit, maybe confused the terminology. Anyway, that was a controversy, and he was misrepresented by all. He was always his own man, in a good sense, in a good and godly sense, uh, not not in a bad sense. Uh, but he, he he was quite prepared to go his own way uh, if he saw that was a biblical way. But anyway, that was a, the second controversy. And the third controversy uh, dogged him uh, in his last years, but it concerned his views on separation. And again, uh, somewhat misrepresented uh, in certain places, but uh, in some sense, understandably so. In 1966, uh, evangelicalism divided over Lloyd Jones's call for evangelicals to put their evangelicalism above their denominationalism. What that meant was if you're an Anglican evangelical, you're an evangelical first and Anglican second. If you're a Presbyterian evangelical, you're evangelical first and Presbyterian second and Baptist and so on. Uh, so that was his call. That was widely regarded as a call for evangelicals to leave mixed denominations as soon as possible because if you're a uh, evangelical Presbyterian, you had far more in common with Evangelical Anglican than you had with a Liberal Presbyterian. And therefore, you sit loosely uh, mixed denomination. So that was certainly the, the first lesson. <coughs> but as I say, it was, it was regarded as a call to leave mixed denominations uh, almost immediately. That's not quite what he said. Uh, but it would head in that direction. The split with Jim Packer was a sad one, uh, but it, and it was linked to the same issue, but it came later. Yeah, in 1960, Packer contributed to a book, Growing Into Union, uh, which he, he wrote. There were two evangelicals who wrote that book and, and two Anglo-Catholics, and, and it was an anti-liberal book, uh, supposed to be an anti-liberal book, and, and Packer... Uh, as I say, it contributed to it. Uh, Lloyd Jones was horrified, uh, and again, it got somewhat out of hand. And uh, uh, but Packer contributed to his own woes, I believe. Uh, although, he, in one sense, he was trying to say that. Uh, Anglo-Catholics are not liberals, and so they're not in the same category. 
as Liberals. Uh, but uh, I, I think his response to the whole thing was somewhat confused and, and this was not a good time uh, for the evangelicals uh, to waver. I think they're, they're all over the place anyway and increasingly getting all over the place. But Martin Lloyd-Jones thought it was inconsistent for evangelicals to be strict, for example, in their student groups at university uh, where there was a liberal group and there was a, a, an evangelical group and never the twain shall meet. Uh, if you're strict there but you're compromised in your denomination. He says, that doesn't make sense. That, there's an inconsistency there. So what mattered to uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones and to Scripture, uh, in his view, and rightly so, is the nature of the church. And this speech at the uh, National, Association, uh, National Assembly sorry, of Evangelicals in October 1966, it, it, it still has got to be soundly refuted and... Uh, the only thing to be said, I think, is uh, that all that's taken place in the Anglican Communion and, and in the Church of Scotland since uh, would indicate a certain naivety, if nothing else, on the part of his detractors. Uh, did he get it right? Uh, fundamentally, yeah. He's, he, he picked it uh, and uh, the evangelicals have either got squeezed out or become... Uh, ineffective because they're so isolated in these mixed denominations. On the 1st of March, which was St David's Day, and very appropriately so, uh, 1981, Lloyd-Jones came to die. He'd become frail. Uh, he'd lost his powers of speech. He'd scribbled on a piece of paper. Very Luther-like, isn't it? That's what Luther did as he was dying. Uh, do not pray for healing, do not hold me back from the glory. And uh, one of his daughters, uh, Elizabeth, pointed to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Uh, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And she pointed to that. And uh, Lloyd-Jones, very feeble condition, nodded with some vigour. It was probably the last vigorous thing he did. Uh, he, he could respond to this and respond very much in the affirmative. Packer, of course, had this dispute with uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he has continued to celebrate Martin Lloyd-Jones as the greatest man he's ever known. The weakness of the modern church in the modern world was, in Lloyd-Jones's view, largely the fault of the church. The church is fond of, oh, the conditions here have changed and uh, we need to be new people in a new world and all the rest of it. Uh, we, we need to listen to the world's agenda of course, we need to listen to the world's agenda, but the world doesn't set the agenda. God does. And so Lloyd-Jones, by and large, blamed the church. It's the fault of the church that's in the condition that it is. So at least to focus on that. Too much of the professing church put unity and peace above truth, which is not to say that Lloyd-Jones thought being doctrinally pure would solve everything. As we go on, we'll see that that's not true. That's not what he said. But he said, nothing so surely drives the world away from the truth as uncertainty or confusion in the church with respect to the content of her message. Now, that, that's something of his life and his controversies. Let's, let's now just introduce something uh, to do with his preaching, say a few things and then... Uh, God willing, next hour, say some more things about Lloyd Jones as a preacher. Some of the characteristics. He, he, he said this, I've always found this most moving. He said, I gave up nothing. So when people said, oh, <coughs> here he was, he, he was a Harley Street specialist, uh, he had his future mapped out in front of him, and what a wonderful future that would have been, and met with all. Uh, people of high society and 
could have had an influence on them. And so, but he gave all that up and he said, I gave up nothing. I received everything. I counted the highest honour that God could confer on any man to call him to be a herald of the gospel. So that, that was his view. He said, preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone could ever be called. He also said that he wouldn't cross the road to listen to himself. <laughs> uh, so uh, he had this exalted view of the preacher. The, the preacher is declaring the word of God. This is God himself. This is not parliament legislating and compromising and doing what parliaments do. This is the declaration of the truth of God, uh, but uh, not to listen to yourself. Uh, he was also opposed to a critical study of sermons, which is rather discouraging for what I'm trying to do now. We're trying to look at him, uh, we'll get to it, look at him as a preacher. Uh, he did give lectures on preaching and preachers, which is a wonderful book. Uh, I think perhaps Stuttgart is the best book on preaching I've read. Uh, there's other good ones, but uh, he did yeah, give those lectures. So... We're not always totally consistent, are we? But he, he, he disliked a critical study of, of sermons in the sense that it, it was the wrong spirit in which to approach the word of God. So if someone is proclaiming the word of God and, and you're trying to pick up errors and uh, it, you're not, it's not a worshipful spirit uh, and it, it's not a performance. Uh, it, it's something far greater than that and that's what he disliked. He considered the practice of publishing sermons had done much harm to preaching. I think that's probably a throwaway line, uh, that there was some truth in what he said, but I think he's, sometimes he's guilty of a preacher's exaggeration, and that might be one of them. Uh, but what he was, again, pity himself against was uh, the, the wrong sort of study. You know, you, when, when you're reading a sermon, same with online preaching, you know, there's a pause button, there's... There's a delete button, there's fast forward. Uh, when you're reading a book, you've got more control over the book. And, and uh, he thought that the Holy Spirit, uh, it could, could speak through anything, of course. He spoke through Balaam's donkey. Uh, and so he could use any means he wanted. But uh, he, he, he disliked taped sermons in the, uh, the age of cassettes or whatever in the car and he, and when the journey's finished you stopped and then you picked it up again he thought that was disruptive of the work of the Holy Spirit that was you know, dampening the work of the Spirit and I think we can see what he means and see the dangers but uh, there's also great blessings that came from it surely but anyway he, he, he thought the practice of publishing sermons did harm because you, you might have say 15 minutes of time to read and then and if the Holy Spirit was convicting you, well, what do you do next? Well, you've always, always got that problem. Uh, now, what he said of Wales uh, is true of the West as a whole. In fact, for all the world. He wrote this, he or preached this. The chief need of Wales is great and theological and doctrinal preaching, which will emphasise the sovereignty of God the ugliness of sin, the uncertainty of life, the judgment and eternity, the glory of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the all-sufficiency of his saving work for us on the cross, the resurrection and the blessed hope we have. That that's what the preacher had to centre on. He believed in preparation and unction. So he didn't just believe in, in, in going out there, depending on the Holy Spirit and trust that the Holy Spirit would make up for all your deficiencies and preach through you, whether you're prepared or not. No, you prepare. You do everything in preparation. You prepare well. And he believed in unction. Uh, he <clears throat> very much believed in unction. There was something indefinable about good preaching. He, he could only look to the Holy Spirit to be present in a wonderful way. He said, this unction, this, this anointing, he says, is, is the supreme thing. Uh, and that separated uh, speaking from preaching where God could 
took control and God spoke and, and there was a day of Pentecost, day of power and authority uh, and the unction of heaven upon all that took place. He, he believed there was... Uh, in, in, that didn't detract from preparation and from a hard study of scripture. He believed there was, as there obviously is, uh, you know, logic and, and order in Paul's epistles, for example, and in the evangelistic and sermons in Acts, you know, the, Peter or Paul who was ever preaching doesn't simply get up and hope for the best. Uh, so that you had to work through the logic and the order to see where the preacher was heading and why. He rarely told stories uh, in the pulpit. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, but he, he was not simply a doctrinal preacher. That, that, that's not true. He's not regarded that. That's, that's not right at all. He said Paul's, you know, the apostle Paul, his heart was as big as his brain. Uh, and, uh, you know, Lord Jones is welcome. Uh, he's emotional as, as well as intellectual, both. Uh, so he's, he's not a preacher of doctrinaire reform theology. and uh, He did preach reform theology, but not in a, a doctrinaire way, uh, not in a way that was not aimed at the affections. He did aim at the affections. He said, I spend half my time telling Christians to study doctrine and the other half telling them that doctrine is not enough. So that you, he was double-sided <laughs> in a good way. Uh, he, he could express himself in, in a startling way sometimes. He, he thought that Calvinists needed Methodism uh, because Calvinism uh, could become ossified and, and they could lose, Calvinists could lose their warmth and graciousness. Uh, Methodists, of course, needed some uh, doctrinal buttressing so he thought the two needed each other. Often said that he was a man of the 18th century, not the 17th. The 17th century produced the Westminster Confession, uh, which Lloyd Jones admired and, and, and uh, signed, in, in, in a sense, uh, and, and wanted people to adhere to. Uh, but the 18th century, he thought, was greater because the evangelical fervour and emotion of the revival of that century resonated more with him than the doctrinal position of the, of the Puritans of the 17th century. Now, don't make it either or. <laughs> it, it, uh, he's speaking in general terms of two different centuries, succeeding centuries, and he's appreciating both. He's very much, he's a Puritan, as Richard Sibbs, who brought him out of the Depression, humanly speaking, in 1949. Uh, he's a Puritan, he's 17th century, uh, but, but he... Very much delighted in someone like George Whitfield uh, from the 18th century. And, and he saw uh, churches respond to theological aberration in, in the wrong way, in the sense that they simply became doctrinally precise. And he said, that by itself is insufficient. He says, uh, these are his words, a church can be perfectly orthodox and at the same time perfectly dead and perfectly useless. Uh, so he was not holding back there. He disliked choirs. First thing to do with the choir is get rid of it. Uh, he disliked children's addresses. Uh, he always thought children should understand uh, the, the sermon after a certain age that, that, that's when, that they would get more from that than uh, children's addresses. Uh, he disliked the invitation system. He disliked anything that smacked of entertainment. You're not there to entertain. Um, quirky, even erroneous views could sometimes be expressed. I'll, just, I'll pick up a few here. In, in a sermon delivered in 1933, he said quite vigorously that all sins are equal in God's sight. All sin is sin to God. And miserliness is no worse than drunkenness. Both are equally repugnant to him and equally to be punished. It is we who classify sin, not God. To him, all sin is sin. Uh, so that's what he said in the sermon. No, 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 clearly, obviously, that's not true. That's not how the Bible deals with sin. 
Um, Jesus says to uh, Pilate, well, he who delivered me over to you has the greatest sin. You know, take Caiaphas is the greater sinner than, than Pilate. Uh, the Old Testament sets up different punishments for different sins. It doesn't treat them all as the same. Uh, later in his sermons, John 17, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was rather more measured and biblical, I think. He declared of Christ, sin is to look away from him, to be interested in anything that the world could give rather than in him. Oh, if it is something foul, it is ten times worse. But the best that the world can give me is an insult to him if I put it before him. That's a better way of putting it. Uh, he noted the difference between the modern reformed service of worship and the more communal and varied nature of that re recorded in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 uh, to 31. Uh, having said that, he would say things like that, but... Uh, I don't think there's any evidence at all that, that uh, he made much attempt to implement that at Westminster Chapel. Um, so in, in 1 Corinthians 14, you know what he's referring to. Uh, verse 26 is, Hours of brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm and a teaching and a tongue uh, and a revelation and an inter interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at most three each in turn and then let one interpret it. There's no interpreter. Let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let others judge. If anything is revealed to another who sits by it, let the first keep silent. For uh, you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Now, he takes note of that, but, but he doesn't translate that into, oh, we'll have, say, three preachers, and, and one after the other, and there's no real attempt at Westminster Chapel to to implement anything like that. Uh, or, or. Ephesians five, uh, he saw marriage as a spin-off from the main thrust, which is the believer's re relationship with the Lord. I think the context says it's the other way around. E Ephesians five is on uh, family and day-to-day -day living, and he uses. Uh, the believer's relationship with the Lord as an illustration of that. Now, the, uh, the context is telling you that Martin Lloyd Jones, I think, was gone backwards. He, he delivered five sermons on revival on, uh, on Genesis 26 and, and verses 17 and 18. And uh, they're great sermons. I don't know if they've got much to do with the text, but they are great sermons. Uh, so Isaac departed from there and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and, and dwelt there. And Isaac dug, dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, uh, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. So it was all about... Uh, Removing rubbish first, and, and uh, then the blessing of God would come. I'm not sure it's got much to do with the text, but uh, the, as I say, the, the terrific sermons. Uh, he later tried to justify that when he was pointed out what he'd done, and he, I think he, he does it with rather uh, yeah, a great deal of ingenuity, but not much uh, conviction, perhaps. I've never been able to understand uh, his view of Romans 7. Romans 7... There's an argument about whether Paul is referring to himself before he was a Christian uh, or after, and, and now we've got variations on that, where he's referring to <coughs> um, Israel, uh, you know, himself personified, Israel personified as a person. Or, I guess all sorts of variations, but Romans 7 is the conflict passage. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold up and under sin, what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. And what I hate, that I do. Verse 19. Uh, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. The evil that I will not uh, to do, that I practice. So it, there's uh, at face value, Paul divided uh, against himself. And he, he adopted what I think is a strange view, and I, I'm not sure it's even understandable, 
uh, at least not to me, uh, that Paul was describing a, a non-Christian. And he, he says that uh, Paul is, is not referring to himself, but to one who is not fully regenerate. Now, I'm not sure what that means, uh, but one who struggles without the Spirit, and that shows us that the law cannot sanctify us. So he's describing a person who's under intense conviction of sin and is yet not a Christian. And now, uh, I'll leave that with you, but I'm not sure that he's got all, many ta- all that many takers on that one because uh, the, the classic reform view, of course, is that Paul is describing himself uh, in his ongoing battle with sin. So Romans 7 and Romans 8 belong together. They're just two parts of the same experience. Uh, in, in Romans 8, we're more than conquerors, uh, looking ahead to what to take place. Uh, in Romans 7, you know, we're more than strugglers, as it were. Uh, but they, they're two parts of the Christian experience in, in, uh, in growing as a Christian. Uh, anyway, Lord Jones has got his own views there. As a preacher, he, uh, he worked from the King James Version and would correct it when uh, he saw the need. Uh, but that was still his preferred translation. Uh, so he, he probably belonged to that generation where it was not easy to give it up. Uh, he he didn't like apologetics. He regarded it as of limited value. He didn't think he'd argue people into the kingdom that if they had experienced the Holy Spirit, they would come into the kingdom. So he didn't... Uh, I, I, I think probably he came across too many people who thought that all you need to do is pile up the evidence and people would become Christians. He didn't believe that. He had little notion of common grace. Um, yeah, I, I don't think he disagreed with it, but it, it, uh, he didn't spend much time on it. Uh, he could be an impulsive thinker and uh, he could give a less than nuanced answer to a question. He was, he was very good at history. Uh, he, he picked it up, he, you know, uh, and knew his way around it, but he, he, I don't think that's true of the early church. Uh, he praised the Montanists and the Donatists and, and from the early period, the early church, neither of which deserves the praise that he gives them, in my view. Uh, the, the Montanists uh, were just erroneous and, and uh, believed the coming of the Spirit in Phrygia, the second coming was near, I mean, and uh, they made these holding this proclamation that just didn't take place. Um, they might remind you of the 1840s in America where, where there was a lot of uh, speculation that Christ would come in 1844 and something, too many people believed it. Uh, the Montanists were something like that at the end of the second century. The Donatists were a holiness group and uh, <laughs> totally overdone. Uh, so no other baptism was valid. You know, we're the only true church. Uh, there is not the slightest possibility of even uh, a sensible character, half decent, uh, in, in, uh, in the main tr- church, the great church. Uh, so the Donatists were self-defeating. You know, one sin amongst the Donatists really undermined their own cause. And Augustine's reply to the Donatists, I, I think, is incontrovertible. Uh, but Lloyd-Jones saw the donors as, as worthy of praise. But I think it's probably an indica- indication he didn't know a lot about them, although he knew enough about them to make errors of judgment, perhaps. That's not uh, a statement I shouldn't make, but anyway. <laughs> Regarding public policy, he says it's no part of the business of the state to defend Christian truth. He had no time for an established church, but that's an extreme statement. It's no part of the business of the state to defend Christian truth. Uh, he did not live to see the days where the Royal Navy, for example, came to allow a Satanist chaplain on board uh, its ships. That came about. So there, there has to be a basis for law, for public law. And I don't know that Lloyd Jones thought that through. Uh, truth is vital, it, it not only acquits, it, it transforms. It, it, he told his congregations, you walk the streets of London, remember you have the reputation of God in your hand. 
1971, he said, life. There is a lack of life amongst us. What is the cause? It's due to a lack of realisation that God is a living God. There is a neglect on our part of the living God. Our supreme need is to realise God is alive. He, he saw paper creeds as important, but they're not the same as spiritual life. But a man cannot preach in cold blood, <laughs> he thundered. And he, he, he looked at himself as a preacher, a very honest man, and he, he said his greatest def defect as a preacher was a lack of powerful love for the congregation. Uh, this, this is where he fell short. Uh, as in every area, we all do. Uh, truth was to be combined with emotion. And that's why he loved George Whitfield so much. He's this Calvinist who's a powerful preacher, powerful proclaimer of, of the gospel. And the Apostle Paul, Paul wept for his people. You know, a number of places, Acts 20, and Romans 9 and, and Philippians 3, verse 18. And I'll finish this first part on this this point is, is perhaps surprising and, and, and can be much misunderstood. But he, he said the first business of the preacher is to be inspirational. Now, he, he detested the you know, inspiring thoughts for daily living or that approach. He, that, that's not his at all. Uh, tr but he, he wanted truth to be inspiring and to gather people together and and the, uh, the mind is caught up with the affections and it's unified. And there's the proclamation of, of the new man in Christ. So we'll just break here and then we'll come back and we'll look uh, more closely at Lloyd-Jones as a, as a preacher.